Thanks. Welcome to another event at the 2017 Iowa City Book Festival presented by the Iowa City UNESCO City of Literature. We would like to thank the sponsors who made the event possible. That's the City of Iowa City, the University of Iowa, the Iowa Arts Council, the Iowa City Coralville Convention and Visitors Bureau, Iowa Public Radio, and the Tuesday Agency. The vast majority of book festival events are offered without charge, but they are not free. Your tax-deductible donation gives us the ability to offer programs like this festival. Please consider supporting the City of Literature by texting the word book to the number 319-774-7669. Today as part of the panel discussion, Who Do You Read? We'll hear from uh, the authors you see in front of you, who I'll be introducing in a second. They're going to discuss what authors they love to read. And has any one writer or particular text been the igniting experience that opened up the path of writing for you? My name's Hugh Ferrer. I will be the moderator. Uh, I'll introduce them uh, uh, in line. Um, so on my far right is Kaori Fujino, a fiction writer from Japan who writes short stories and novellas about the horror that likes, lurks beyond, behind everyday life. In 2006, she won the Bunga Kukai Prize for new writers for her story, Iyashi Tori, uh, transliterated as The Greedy Bird. Her most recent collection of stories is Final Girl, which is from 2016. Next to her is Christian Senden Cordero, a poet, poet, fiction writer, essayist, translator, and filmmaker from the Philippines. Two of his most recent poetry collections received the 2014 National Book Awards. His debut collection of poetry in his three respective languages won the Madrigal Gonzalez Best Book first book prize in 2006, and he is still the deputy director of the Ateneo de Naga University Press. Next to Christian is Lori Erickson, who from her early childhood on an Iowa farm grew up to travel, uh, to, who travels the world as a writer specializing in holy sites, journeys that led her on an ever deepening spiritual quest. In Holy Rover, she weaves her personal narrative with description of a dozen pilgrimages. A travel writer and Episcopal deacon, Erickson is, engaging, is an engaging guide for pilgrims eager to take a spiritual journey. Uh, Dilman Dilla a fiction, is a fiction maker and filmmaker from Uganda. He's the author of three volumes, The Flying Man of Stone, A Killing in the Sun, and Crane's Crest at Sunset. His uh, The Felistas Fable was the film of the year at the 2014 Uganda Film Festival. And last but not least, to my immediate right is Donald Dre Pollock, who was born in 1954 and raised in Knockham Stiff, Ohio, and has lived his entire adult life in Chillicothe, where he worked at the Mead paper mill as a laborer and truck driver until age 50, when he enrolled in the English program at Ohio State University. While there, Doubleday published his debut short story collection, Knockham Stiff, this was followed by The Devil All the Time, his first novel, which was published in 2011, and his newest book is called The Heavenly Table. Please help me welcome our panelists. For format, we're going to have, uh, we're going to have each panelist uh, give a short presentation, and then we'll go into a discussion, uh, which will include questions from the audience. Uh, at the microphone at the rear of the room. So uh, we'll start off with uh, Kaori, please, thank you. Hi. Uh, I prepared my draft, so I, I will read it. Um, I have always come to like books that get rid of stereotypes. When I was a girl, Luke Hong. You need to speak louder. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I have always come to like books that get rid of stereotypes. When I was a girl, Luc Hong Kaye, uh, in English, The Notebook, written by Agota Kristoff, and the poem Du Carrot, uh, in English, Carrot Head, written by Jules Renard, told me that children are by no means always adorable and obedient. They told me I didn't need to act that way. And also, they told me that children have to fight with adults and other children to win their own place. I learned we are never perfected. Our bodies just grow while a part of our spirit remains damaged. In adolescence, I read Japanese contemporary literature such as Haruki Murakami, Eimi Yamada, Yukio Mishima, Osamu Dazai, 
or Kobo Abe. But after I started writing, I have preferred to read foreign literature. In Japan, many foreign works are translated into Japanese. Translators translate not only the original versions, but also compile anthologies. I can read only Japanese, so I feel translators are like God. I always appreciate their work. With their help, nowadays, the following have become important writers for me. Uh, for example, uh, Muriel Spark, Carson Mucklers, Kelly Link, Dennis Johnson, Judy Badnitz, Brian Evanson, Vladimir Sorokin, Robert Bolaño, Stephen Milhauser, and so on. When I write, I always have collections of short stories on my desk. I often have writer's block, so I cheer myself up by reading these books. The book I read again and again is, for example, uh, Stepping Out Summer 68, written by Joe or Lansdale. This is an awful, ridiculous, and irredeemable story. Every time I read it, I feel like life is worthless. <laughs> but strangely, after reading it, I can accept myself as a person who is trying to do the useless work of writing novels in my worthless life. And I also love the short story, Hebe Kills Jerry, written by Brian Evanson. This is an awful story as well, and moreover, it doesn't reveal the context or the reason why such savage acts occur. But I think this is the most erotic story I've ever read. Dog Dates, written by Judy Badnitz, is wonderful. Any story about the destruction of the world always calms my soul. I have also been helped by Lynn Dean's and Miranda July's short stories. I am confident that many books will help me from now on too. Thank you. The question for all its seemingly lightweight appearance is a difficult one to answer, especially if you raise it to a writer. Who do you read? My only consolation in this question is that it does not contain the word favorite. Otherwise, I would not volunteer for this panel. <laughs> that word horrifies me as I think of it as a cage, an entrapment, albeit most showbiz personalities and politicians in my country are really used to answering questions like, what is their favorite place on the planet? Or who is your favorite author? Or what food have changed their lives? Or who is the most influential person in their, in their careers? As if by knowing their favorite food, it would also address the hunger situation in my country. As if their vacation trips will also bring us to the places we have never been or never ever will be. However, what do you really think when we raise the same question to our respective leaders? They will probably find this an interesting question, and they may have to consult their PR handlers what could be the best answer to this same question. If we give the benefit that my president, like many of us here, is also into the business of reading. I remember one politician in the Philippines who thought that he was quoting from Machiavelli's The Fiends when he said, what is essential is invisible to the eye. Well, at least he knows Machiavelli, and the fact that he confused the prince and the little prince is something that we can forgive. <laughs> Maybe these celebrities buy books because they can, but it does not necessarily mean that they read. Books, after all, can provide a good backdrop for a photograph. Suppose that the same question is raised to Oprah or to the Pope. I know for sure that it will generate attention among their followers, and for the writers and publishers, this will certainly be a good news. I am afraid I do not have that huge following. Though I also like posting books, I am currently reading or planning to read with the hope that my students in the Philippines might just take these books as well. And yes, I do judge the book by its cover. 
I charge the book by its title, and the first and the last sentences in the novel still matter to me. To answer the question, who do you read? I have to think deeply as to what does it mean to be a reader? What does it mean to enjoy the secret pleasures of eyeing and listening unto something whose works can change you, whose words can totally affect you, who can educate your hearts and tells you that the essential is always and must remain invisible to the eye? I have to remember how reading has affected me in such a way that it has generated the many personalities that I try to possess and inhabit. The magic of it all, when you can go and travel far away lands without taking a single step. A Chinese learned man once said that a journey to a thousand miles begin with one step, and I think this singular step means the page that you flip in the book. The fact that I continue to read is not because I have become the writer that I am today. I read because it is listening to me. I need to listen. In Bicol, the language of my birth, we have this word, himatea, which means to listen. It is different from dangog, to hear. The root word is mate, which means to feel. That is why, in my language, when one is in love, you say, may namamatea na ko sa imo. But this can also mean, I am deeply afflicted by you. In other words, in Bicol universe, in the Bicol universe, one cannot feel if one cannot listen. I believe that every writer is a reader, that his discovery to writing is antedated by the fact that he or she has discovered and relished for something that is tangible, audible, and sensual. Growing up in the Philippines, I would usually encounter all these different books in English, and they all have this printed on the cover page, number one New York bestseller list. All these pocket books would come to us, and one begins to wonder that probably the reason why New York is the city that never sleeps is because it's a city of readers. <laughs> and I also wondered at that time how all these books can all be number one. How can they all agree that all these books are number one? How do they read these books and decide that these are all number one? So my friends and I decided to play a hunting game, and that is to look for the number two. <laughs> <laughs> or the number three, or even the number 10 in the New York bestseller list. Today I have learned how things can be part of that list, and how things just, just can change in a matter of week, like in the music chart or the blockbuster hits. How things can be so very much like a horse <coughs> race, a competition like no other. Should we have an Iowa bestseller list? After all, this is one of UNESCO cities of literature. I am not sure if we should have another list, as I have grown suspicious <coughs> to this kind of listing and these marketing strategies and campaigns to read homogenized materials. Let them have all the list, but let's keep the gist in this city. After all, I'd rather continue to discover, to go to the less road travel, the terra incognito where some glorious manuscripts are waiting for me, like these pickle translations that I am reading now, uh, the translation of Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace and Gustave Flaubert's Madame Bovary, which I am now currently reading. Translated after the Pacific War, these translations in Beagle were done by Rosalio Imperial Sr. And interestingly, this author did not just translate it to the local languages. He also translated these novels into what we call the Corrido. It's a poetic form of four stanzas, 12 syllables, monorhyme. So in my region, we can sing Madame Bovary and Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace. I am annotating these manuscripts, and hopefully we can turn this into new books in the next two years. As a writer who can navigate in four languages, that means I can swim in four rivers. English and Filipino slash Tagalog are Rio del Grande. Filipino is a language course taught alongside with English. We are taught grammar lessons in Filipino and in English, while Rinconada, my first mother tongue, <coughs> remains to be an oral language, while Bicol, the language engineered by the Spanish friars during the colonial period, is gaining a new ground. It is my desire to continue writing and translating works to Bicol and Rinconada after Borges, Kafka, Wilde, and Rilke. 
so that one day another writer from my region may come here and continue to talk more about these things I'm telling you now. Thank you. I'd like to say I was honored to be asked to be on this panel because people aren't interested in the books that I read. Uh, and it was an interesting um, exercise this morning to write down the books that have really influenced me. Um, I write a lot at the intersection between travel and spirituality, and looking at the list of books that came immediately to my mind, they're almost all in the spirituality side rather than the travel side. And uh, I don't know quite what that means, but uh, it was interesting to see that. Um, if I had to name a single book that really changed the direction of my thinking and my writing, it would be Kathleen Norris's Dakota, A Spiritual Geography. Uh, which is oh, at least 25 years old now. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with Kathleen Norris. She's a writer from South Dakota, a poet, an essayist. And um, her book, Dakota, is um, a memoir really about place and how it shaped her spiritual life. And uh, that book just captured my imagination. And I think I read it three times now, and, and I think well, one of the things I would say about the books that I love, and I'm sure many of you feel this as well, they're like old friends. You, know, you, you, you have them on your shelf and it just makes you feel good to see that they're there, because you know you can always go into them again. Um, the other writers who have really influenced me, who I really admire, are people who write about their spiritual journeys in a way that makes you feel like you're sitting down with a friend. Uh, and so I'll, I'll throw out a, a few names of, of people that I especially like. Anne Lamott, of course. Everyone loves Anne Lamott. Um, uh, Thomas Merton, uh, a monk uh, and writer who died in, oh, I think, 1961, uh, wrote uh, books that include Sign of Jonas and New Seeds of Contemplation. Uh, and even though his books are um, now several decades since they've been published, I think that they always bear reading and rereading. They're really beautiful, insightful books. Um, more contemporary author, Barbara Brown Taylor, especially An Altar in the World. Uh, one of the themes that I try to write about is the idea of uh, the spirituality in the midst of everyday life, or on travel in the midst of everyday life. Uh, and that's a really beautiful book uh, that um, was influential for me. Nadia Bowles Weber, who I like to think of as the most interesting Lutheran in the world. I know that seems like the tallest building in Wichita, perhaps, but uh, <laughs> Nadia, as maybe some of you know, has tattoos all up, up and down her arms. And uh, she is a Lutheran pastor, and she's uh, feisty and swears a lot, and uh, really, I think, helps break the mold of what it means to be to write about spirituality. Uh, you don't have to be a nice girl in order to do that. Um, an influence on my work is, has been Mary Roach, and she doesn't write anything about spirituality. I'm sure some of you know her work. She's the, she, all of her titles are one words, uh, so bonk, which is about sex, and gulp, which is about digestion, and stiff, which is about cadavers. Um, I love her style because it's both informative and humorous, and you feel like you know her in, uh, in reading her books. And when I, whenever I see she's written another book, I'll say, okay, I'll read it, because I just want to go along with her. I don't care what she's investigating. I know it's going to be interesting. Uh, and, that's, and I think that's what I try to do in my writing, this sense of, well, you don't know where I'm going to go, but it might be interesting to go along with me. Um, to wrap up, right now I'm reading a lot of books about death, because uh, my next book is, is about trips that have helped me come to terms with mortality. And, and it actually leads me into saying, I think I read less now than I used to, and part of it is a sense of, weird sense of competition. So all of these writers, now when I read them, I think, oh, they're so much better than I am. Mm -hmm. and, and it makes me feel bad. <laughs> Or I think, oh, well, I could have probably said that better than they did, and then that's not really healthy either. And so, um, so I'm trying to read more carefully now. And I think that that's, um, 
I like that. And so I try to read right away in the morning, and I try to read often just a couple of pages, but I, I, but it, but I want them to be worthwhile books. And so um, I've been reading a lot of Buddhism these days, especially Joan Halifax, uh, Being with Dying, which is a wonderful book. Um, so that's an overview of what I'm, I'm reading, and uh, I'm interested to hear more about what other people have to say. Mm-hmm. I actually read less as well. Mm-hmm. Um, for the last few years, I've actually not been finishing books. I don't know how many books I've finished in the last three or four years. I, I start, and then um, I reach the middle, and I can't continue, and I never figure out why. Um, maybe it's because most of what I read is um, science fiction fantasy. So those kinds of books I can finish. I can go on to the end. But there's a lot of distractions, you know, there's internet, there's TV, there's radio, um, no, no, not radio, but internet and um, movies, you know, like you can watch movies more easily now than in the past. Any, any movie you want to watch, you just Google it and, and you can uh, watch it, which puts a lot of um, pressure on what exactly I'm going to pick up and, and read. But. Um, I like books that have science fiction and fantasy in them, mostly because uh, I did not start reading until I was about 10 years old. Um, Because in our school, we didn't have reading for pleasure. You had to read to learn, and you had to read uh, because what the teacher has given you. And most of the time, these books were supposed to be they wouldn't give you books that they thought were, um, how, how do I, that, that are not realistic. They, they gave you books that were grounded in reality about, you know, um, family life, you know, life in, in your home. But when, when, it, when it comes to books about, that have fantastical elements in them, they will, they will think that is not uh, worthy of, um, are being given to children, or that's not something that a student should be reading. But then, uh, before I started reading books, I was a lot into storytelling. We used to tell each other stories, because at that time, uh, there was no, uh, we had only one radio station in the country, Uganda, and it was so boring that people would only turn it on during news hour, and then they turn it off after the news has finished, and most of the time that news was not even uh, reliable news. It was just government propaganda. And it will always start with wh- what the president ate that day, where he went, and what he's doing. Um, so we, and there was always no electricity. So even the one TV station that we had, we could not um, tune to it. And, but we used to sit around um, in the kitchen in the nights, in the evenings. And then we'll tell each other stories. And most of those stories, or all of those stories, were about ghosts and about zombies and about uh, all these cool things. <laughs> so by, by the time I started to read books, you know, I, I, um, and OK, when I was 10 years, they opened a library in our school. And then they put there a lot of books. But they told us these are story books. And for the first time, they were encouraging us to read uh, for pleasure. But then when I heard of a storybook, I, I was thinking of um, a book that tells a story. And the stories that I knew of were stories that had all this cool stuff, like ghosts and zombies and, and things like that. But the library did not have a, a wide variety of that. I remember finding only one book, and I read it over and over again. And it was called uh, Yo and the Python. I don't remember who wrote it. But it was like one of my favorite books at, at that age. And it was about a little boy who befriends a python. And I don't remember what happened in the story, but they were friends. And they, they used to have a lot of adventures together, uh, this boy and the snake. So it was not until I reached uh, secondary school, that's around 13 years, that I, got a, a, I went to a school that, that, uh, that used to be a, a British Catholic school, and it had a huge library with books from the 1940s, colonial times, basically. 
And so, but most of these books, um, many of them, I mean, had the kind of stuff that I, I like to read, the dragons, the zombies, the ghosts, and, and stuff like that. But I was yearning to read up that kind of book with, um, based in Africa or based in my own world or um, with, with things that I knew about and things like you and the Python was about a boy in Nigeria who befriends a, a Python. And I couldn't find any kind of book like that. And as I grew older, I discovered that uh, many of the, or w as I grew older, what I discovered or what I thought is that um, after independence, the, the Africans who were educated and elite, I think they were too eager to show off that they were educated and elite. And so they did not believe in the superstitions of the peasants or superstitions in courts. So they try to distance themselves very much in things that will be called superstitious, like ghost stories, you know, set in, in, the, in the country, or um, these, these stories with fantastical elements. Even today, it is like that, you know, like if you write a, a story in, based in Uganda and it, it has got a, a wizard in it or a witch in it, you, there will be a backlash, and you know, people will call you, you know, a satanist. You, you, you. you you do black magic and things like that. But the other same people who will uh, worship Harry Potter, and, the, and they will read every book of Harry Potter, they will, they will watch all um, Harry Potter movies, and they will buy for their children Harry Potter dolls, because um, there is a way it, it feels it's not connected to the reality on the ground. So they're like, oh, it's just a, like a fairy tale. Um, the first book that I uh, when I reached university, that's when I discovered uh, an author called Amos Tutola, and he blew me away. Because by that time, then I realized that actually there are books set in Africa that have these kinds of stuff that I like. Um, his book was The Palm Wine Drinkard, and I read it and I was blown away. Now, first I read one called The Feather Woman of the Jungle, which was just, and um, I had never read, read anything like that. And then um, many years later, I read the Palma and Drinkard. So of, of late, people like uh, from the mid 2010s, 2005, 2010s, a lot of African writers have begun putting out work of, uh, of this kind of nature. I think there's some kind of, I don't think it's a backlash. It's just uh, people reclaiming what, or people writing what they love to, to read and not just being uh, not, not writing what the elites and what the schools and what the readers in the continent think they should be, be, be writing. And, oh, not readers, but the publishers on the continent what think that they should be writing. Even uh, all the prizes um, that offer, the, all the prizes are around the, the continent, what they used to, the stories they used to give award prizes to, they wouldn't award a, a story to, um, a prize to a ghost story, but that has started to change. And I think uh, one of my short stories, which was a ghost story, it was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Short Story Prize around 2013. I was surprised when I submitted it because it was a ghost story, and I thought, oh, they will never take this kind of thing. So I think that was a sign of of, of things changing. And the last few years, there are many books that are now being published that, that is set in the continent and that have all these cool, cool stuff. And maybe if more of them uh, uh, keep getting published, I will have a lot more things to read and to relate with, yeah. Okay, I probably should have prepared a little bit more for this, but um um, you know, as Hugh mentioned earlier, I grew up in a place called Knockhamstiff, which is just a little village like in a holler in southern Ohio. And um, most of the people who lived there were very poor. My parents, uh, fortunately, were not. Uh, my dad had a good job, and uh, uh, they owned a, a general store, and uh, so... I was one of the lucky ones uh, as far as growing up there. However, um, 
There were no books in our home. Uh, there was not even a Bible. Um, not that my parents didn't read, but what they read were like true romance magazines, crime magazines, that sort of thing. So my first experience with reading was trash, uh, I guess you would call it. And, um, and really that continued for quite a while. Um, the school I went to had this weird rule where I think it was until you were in the seventh or eighth grade, you couldn't check a book out of the library. <laughs> and, and I didn't have a library card to the, the one in the city. So, um, so I read a lot of, you know, true romance, crime fiction, mag or crime magazines, true crime magazines. Um, and then I remember when I was about, uh, I think I was, I was 15 or 16, I was at my cousin's house and there was this big thick yellow paperback lying on the table, well, which one of them had shoplifted from a drugstore in town. <laughs> but it was, um, it was called A Garden of Sand by a guy named Earl Thompson. And so I took this book home and I must have read it seven or eight times over the summer. And <clears throat> it was set in the Depression in the Midwest um, and it was filled with dysfunctional families, poor people, drug addicts, um, handicapped people, freaks, I mean, just all kinds of stuff. And it was the first time when I felt that, wow, people can write a book about the kinds of people that I grew up with. Um, and so that book has always been a big influence, even, you know, though I didn't start writing until I was 45. I can see sort of the trajectory, you know, of that book into what I wrote 30-some, 40-some years later. Um, so after that, after I got into high school and I started reading, you know, I read a lot of, you know, a lot of the classics, stuff like that. And then I, I quit high school and I went to work and I worked in a paper mill for the next 32 years. Um, when I was in my 30s though, the mill had this program where you could go to college part-time, they would pay for it and uh, I ended up getting an English degree. So it was at that point, I think, when my reading really took off as far as getting serious. Um, and I think the m next most influential book for me was probably Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. And I read that, you know, in my early 30s. Um, and it just sort of, you know, I guess after that, the Southern fiction sort of became the attraction. And um, that has been, you know, if you, anybody in here has read any of my stuff, that is definitely the biggest influence. So people like Faulkner, Barry Hanna, William Gay, Ron Rash, um, Carson McCullers, Flannery O'Connor, I read all those people. Um, and. Now, I have to say that today, I don't read them so much. Uh, I've, I did, I read just about everything, you know, that, that they wrote. And, um, and, you know, I tried, you know, when I started learning how to write, to develop, you know, sort of my own style. Um, and uh, I, then I sort of left them behind because they are, you know, um, they, they can be very influential on me, you know, and, and get into my style. Um, I was told one time that <clears throat> if you don't love to read, you're probably not going to be a writer. And I've always taken that to heart, you know. So, and I try to read two books a week. Um, most of the time I can do that. And, um, uh, but but it's it's all kinds of stuff now. I try to I try to vary the reading, you know, nonfiction and fiction. And I'm 62 years old. And I I don't know if anybody in here is 62 years old or not. But 
I, I'm at that age where somebody can ask me, well, what have you been reading lately? And I'll have to stop and think for a minute. You know? <laughs> it's like, okay, I was just reading a book an hour ago and I can't remember what it was. So I jotted down some books that I've read in the last few weeks, okay? And um, one of them is Twilight of American Sanity by a uh, psychiatrist, his name is Alan Francis. And he's talking about well, really, he's talking about how crazy Americans are in the age of Trump. Um, and I really didn't learn a whole lot from that book. You know, I already knew most of that stuff. Um, I'm reading the, I just read the second volume of a three-volume biography of Graham Greene. Um, a, uh, a novel by a Czech writer, his name is, I think, Rebel is how you pronounce it, it's Too Loud a Solitude, and wow, that is a strange book, uh, and it's a good book. Uh, right now, in my bag, I've got um, a collection of Jim Shepard's short stories like you'd understand anyway. I'm sure some of you have heard of Jim Shepard. Just read The Heart of the Matter by Graham Greene. Um, a collection of essays by a guy named Joseph Epstein. I don't know if any of you have heard of Joseph Epstein, but he is a terrific essayist. I mean, he's fantastic. He's my favorite essayist. And the book's called A Literary Education. Uh, I just finished Fahrenheit, or Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. And uh, I just finished a biography of Joseph Conrad. So, you know, I kind of, I, I am really, I've always been infatuated with writers, you know, where other guys like baseball players, sports figures, whatever, writers were, you know, they were my heroes. And I have read, I don't know how many biographies of writers, but a, a bunch. And, um, and I think that's about all I got. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I, have, I have my own questions, but I think this is such a great opportunity for the audience. If you have questions, uh, please just let's, uh, uh, there's a microphone at the back of the room, and uh, when I see somebody at the microphone, I'll know what to do. I'll stop talking. Look, somebody's going to the microphone. Show them how it's done. That's where it's done. Our first question. Um, I have a question. I don't know who wants to answer it. Someone can just kind of jump out. It's for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, like, for instance, I myself am a fiction reader. I love fiction. I just mostly all the time want to read fiction. And I find myself, I have to remind myself to read nonfiction. And I have to kind of push myself towards reading it. Um, what kind of strategies do you have to maybe push yourself out of your comfort zone to things that you don't normally read or things that are very unlike what you write yourself? Um, like, how do you break out of those boxes and find some new material? Um, okay, may, maybe I can go first because I've actually been reading a lot of nonfiction of late, but not the whole book. I can read a very long article of like 10,000, 12,000 words. But um, normally, it's about something that I really like. I, I won't just read nonfiction about anything. It's, it's, it should be a subject that really um, matters to me, in a way. And most of it will be uh, stuff that have been written in a personal way. So it's not like in a school kind of a, a setting. And sometimes I find them much more interesting than actually uh, fiction. Because um, there is a way, like I, I know the way you say you like biographies, there is a way about reading about other people, about real stuff. There is a way it speaks to you more than if, if you're reading a book and you know, oh, this really never happened. And it, it, it touches you in a, in a, in a, in a certain way. But what I'll say, like, if you really want to go into nonfiction a lot, you just pick subjects that really, really, yeah, matter to you. And I don't think you can read nonfiction in a subject that you have no interest in. Like, I read travel stories a lot, 
because I like uh, traveling. I would have been a travel writer in another life. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm a travel blogger. I think of myself as that, not a travel writer. But um, like anything related to travel, and if it's written really nicely and not just, if you go to this place, you find the good hotels here, you find the good mountains here. If it's about someone's life through, you know, how, how they lived in somewhere else, I'll find it very interesting. But that's because I'm really interested in in that area. Mm. Did others want to uh, say anything about how they break out of what they carry? あの、今質問してくださった方はその読者さんであって小説を書いてるわけではないんですか？それ大きい。あの、質問。そう質問した。Are you a writer yourself? She wants to know. Uh, writer. Uh, oh, you're here. Okay. <laughs> 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 you moved on. Fiction writer. あ、最初の小説を書いてる。あ、あの、それだったらあの、えっと、ちょっと。もしかしたらアドバイスできることがあるかもしれないんですけど、あの、私自身はもともとはあの美術の勉強をしていたので、よくその美術の研究書を読んでいました。で、小説家になってからはあの小説以外にもそのまノンフィクションとかそれからまあ
thank you all very much for your uh, for the insight into your sort of reading patterns and um, habits. Um, Christian, I, I noticed that you very artfully avoided um, a list. Uh, but when I was listening to Donald talking, which I really enjoyed, you know, uh, the sort of uh, the way he sort of pulled out some influential texts, but then also gave us just a little insight into what he's been reading lately, which was actually really broad ranging. I, I wondered, Christian, whether you could um, give us a sense of what you've read just in the last month or so, just to give us a sense of where you go, you know, where have you been? <laughs> well, and, uh, uh, last night I and Dillman were planning like, I read Dillman and Dillman reads me. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you can ask questions about the, the writing process and then the reading process. <laughs> uh, the, the, I'm reading Nick Joaquin. Uh, uh, recently, the Penguin Classics released his book of stories. We're celebrating his uh, centenary, his birth centenary in the Philippines. There are only four Filipinos published by Penguin Classics. That's Jose Garcia Villa, who was in New York for a time, and Jose Rizal, the, the, the national hero, who wrote two novels and got executed for writing these novels, and Nick Joaquin's uh, The Woman with Two Navels. Mm. Those are the materials. It's it's an interesting thing because I've read them in high school. Rizal is a required reading. Joaquin is a required reading. But it's a different kind of feeling reading them now in the Penguin Classic Edition. Mm -hmm. You know that kind of thing. Like uh, there are only four Filipinos in that list, and hopefully it will grow soon. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. So those that. things, uh, Julian. Thank you. I just have one more question, if Great. I may, of um, Kaori. I wondered if I could um, get Kaori to just repeat the um, names and authors of those particular short stories that you keep going back to. That you um, you said when you were writing, there there are two or three particular short stories that you read over and over again. And uh, I just wondered if you'd mind repeating the names and authors of those. Mm -hmm. one, one was Brian Evans, I think. Okay, uh, uh, Stepping Out Summer 68, written by Joe R. Lansdale. Thank you. And uh, Hebe Kills Jerry, written by Brian Evanson. And uh, Dog Dates, written by Judy Batnitz. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I saw another hand earlier, so if you would, please. Thanks. This is also thrown out to the whole table, not to any specific person. We live in the age of the greatest time suck ever invented, and it's this. Yeah. I would like uh, a couple people to talk about ways in which engagement with internet and social media enriches your literary life as a writer or as a reader, uh, and you know gives you kind of new a new microphone to talk to, or new places, you know, new things to read, and ways in which you have to discipline yourself so that it doesn't just make an entire morning or evening disappear like that. Laura, Laura do you want to start? Sure. <laughs> it is such a time suck, and it is so tempting, and I really do think it's um, a spiritual issue, and mm -hmm. that... Um, I think we need to practice discipline in how much time we spend on our phones and iPads. Uh, so I'll say that, first of all. I think it has to be controlled or else it can get out of hand. But I would also say as a writer that I, um, I appreciate the incredible uh, connections that are possible and also how much easier it is to do research because I started writing well before the computer age. And, it, and I remember going to places and just getting stacks and stacks of material, brochures and books and everything, because it would be so hard to check all that stuff b before. And now, I don't have to do that. It's just a lot easier to get the basic information. You still have to check it and everything. But um, I also appreciate, as a writer, the connections with other writers. And so thanks, thanks to Facebook in particular, there's a group of people, fellow travel writers, who I know where they're traveling, and we have a similar sense of humor about things. And as someone who's been a freelancer and independent for 30 years, I really appreciate having those friends that are there whenever I open up my computer. Um, so it goes both ways, I think. Donald, did you? Well, yeah, for me, um, okay, I have a cell phone in my pocket. Uh, but the only time that I 
ever carry a phone is when I'm traveling. That's it. When I go home, the phone goes in the drawer, and the next time I travel, I'll have to get out, charge it up, all that stuff. Um, now, I do use the internet um, more than I should, uh, but <clears throat> uh, in the room where I write, there is no internet, there's no phone, there's nothing but, a, there's a laptop that's not hooked up to the, you know, the internet or anything, that's it. Um, probably I use the internet most for um, uh, either looking up writers or books or buying books. That's really about it. Um, I don't do a whole lot of research as far as uh, you know, my fiction goes. So, um, that, that you know, I, I try to keep it to a minimum. Uh, it's um, you know, I, and I think that it's just me. You know, I think you know, um, I'm older and I, I didn't grow up with it, and I, I really don't feel a need. You know, that I need it. Um, I am very satisfied just sitting on my porch, staring out and doing nothing, you know? <laughs> I don't need to have a device in my hand all the time and to be hooked up and connected. Um, yeah, I just, I really don't understand it. But, you know, I think, too, that's just, you know, me uh, 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 and my age and everything, so, yeah. Gentlemen, you already said a little bit earlier about how uh, it's pulling away from your reading, but uh, yeah, it's actually, I found a way of dealing with this thing. Yeah. One is um, most of the, actually, all the books that I've finished in the last four years, I've read them on phones. <laughs> <laughs> Strangely speaking, when I get a, um, a paperback, you know, I, I get so easily distracted that I want to go back. And, and check something. So I started reading them here, and every time I'm, 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 I'm looking at it somehow. Um, <clears throat> I, I think one advantage I found with this is that um, I can change the text mm. to whichever, to, to my advantage, so I don't have to strain on a very small mm. thing, and I can read it anyway. I can read it on a bus, I can read it mm. even while I'm standing. I remember reading. Uh, uh, a, a Song of Fire and Ice, those big books by... Uh, oh, uh, George R. R. Martin. George R. Martin, yeah. I read them on a phone. It was even smaller than this. And sometimes I would be standing online and, and, and looking at it. <laughs> it's a long line. Yeah, yeah, very long line. But then <laughs> um, one, one other way I dealt with it is on all social media, most of the things or people I follow are people who are most likely to share things that will make me read. So I, sh I, I um, uh, like on most of what uh, I, I like reading travel stuff, I'll maybe follow you if you keep sharing travel stories. <laughs> so most of, I think I follow all the, the, the big travel sites, BBC Travel, Nat Geo Travel. So if I go to Twitter, the first, most of the things, the first things that I'm going to see is either an article about some place or something. And then, uh, so I'm, I'm not just l looking at cat videos, but I can, you know, go and read <laughs> something. Nothing against cat videos. No, there's not. nothing against cat videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I found it, I found it like um, the best way to, to, you know, you cannot fight it, it's there. And so you just find ways of using it. Yeah. So, I, and the people I follow, if I find somebody is posting stuff that, is too distracting, like, you know, which I, I don't like, I unfollow them. And then the person who keeps posting articles, keeps posting stuff that I can read, and most of them are like articles you can read in five, ten minutes, maybe, and you know. That's great. Did, Christian, did you have something to say? I think uh, Kaori brought up a, uh, brought up an item, was that to? Okay, uh, so. Kaori first. Thank you. Uh, I always watch cat photos. <laughs> and um, uh, I always use it uh, here. Uh, wait, I Google what I want to say. So <laughs> it's very useful. And uh, without Google Maps, I can't go anywhere. So <laughs> it's very nice. 
but uh, I actually I am an ad addict of <laughs> internet. So uh, when I when I try to write, I always watch uh, YouTube or uh, online shopping, and so so na toki. すみません、急に日本の製品でポメラという日本の機械でポメラと言うんですけど、インターネットにつながっていなくて小説を書くことしかできません。ポメラ？ポメラ？ポメラ。あ、そう。It's made in Japan. It's called a Brought to you by. Brought to you by Japan. The Philippines is a very has a very interesting case. Like we're the we're one of the top users of the social media, and yet we're we're also known as a country of non-readers. Like, but things are changing now. In the recent Manila International Book Fair, like they had really a huge traffic of people lining up for books. So I'm very much, while this is a, a good thing to happen, like we can access materials through the internet, I still believe that most parts of my country remains to be powerless. By that, I mean they don't have electricity. So I think the best way to come to these communities would still be books, and I believe this is, you know, this this gathering would still, you know, support for the publication of actual books, like the smell of it, you know, the tangible feeling of holding onto something like a book, even if it's too fragile and uh, you know it's it's consumable. So as 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 I am also a deputy director of a small university press. We are not yet moving to the digital publication because we want people, we want our readers, our young people, to get into this, you know, actual, uh, the physicality of, of, of books and the smell of it. So, I think that's the perfect note to end on. Uh, please give our panelists another round of applause.